about for sure. And I can, you've, you've really had an interesting, uh, you know, career. And in, in, in publishing, I'm not well familiar with. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Welcome very much to Conversations, where I'm pleased to welcome to the program Andre Schifrin. He's the head now of the uh, entity called the New Press, uh, a publishing entity here in New York City, located, headquartered here, and uh, of, a, of a very, very interesting charge that they have there, and we're going to talk about it. And uh, Andre Schifrin, welcome very, very much to Conversations and well, to uh, Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. We want to talk about the new press and publishing, but I find uh, very often it's good in these matters if you could perhaps share your own background a little bit with the audience. Uh, you've been, you were with mm -hmm. um, with the Random House uh, for a long while, right. Pantheon, and uh, could you could you share your own background a little bit, and then maybe we could talk some about the challenges and the opportunities that sure. uh, publishing presents. Now. Be glad to. Be glad mm -hmm. to. No, for s close to 30 years, I worked uh, as the head of Pantheon Books, which was a division of Random House, an editorially independent division in those days, though it no longer is. Mm -hmm. um, and we published uh, some of the more interesting um, fiction and nonfiction writers during the, those last decades. Um, and uh, after some 28 years, to be precise, mm -hmm. uh, the management at Random House decided to change the nature of what it was publishing. And my colleagues and I all felt that we didn't want to be part of that change, mm -hmm. uh, so that um, we all decided to leave at the, in uh, in response to the the compromises and decisions that were being asked of us. And uh, I started something new, a different kind of publishing house called the New Press, mm -hmm. which we founded uh, close to seven years ago, but which is now about to celebrate the fifth anniversary of its first title. Congratulations! Well, thank you. Yes. thank you. No, it's been an exciting period, and we've published some, some 200 books in that time, mm -hmm. uh, many of which have been widely reviewed, some of which have been uh, national bestsellers, others have, have had good reviews, but lesser sales. Uh, but they've been books that embody the kind of publishing that we think is needed in the country as it, as it now is. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Pantheon was a, uh, you know, it, it has a rich tradition. It was right. a rich, I thank you very much for your work that you contribute to that, to the books that they made available. Over the over the long haul, 28 years you say mm -hmm. is a very long time to be publishing quality uh, quality uh, work like that. Um, when you say there was a change, may, if I may, uh, you could share with me the publishing world and so forth. We're coming into a world of electronic media. We're coming into a world of new economic uh, dimensions and so forth. The publishing um, world is concerned with things of the mind, intellectual matters and so forth, but it's also in the business world. Mm -hmm. Um, has there been a change in terms of the ability of those who are trying to bring good, a new, a new original, original and uh, well-crafted literature or thought to the American public in terms of business realities intruding perhaps on those editorial decision-making processes more than they traditionally have? Or what has been the dynamic between those in a thumbnail way historically in the publishing business as right. it were? Well, Publishing has changed enormously in the last few years, okay. uh, so much so that many aspects of it are no longer recognizable. Mm. Uh, and the main shift has been one of ownership. Mm -hmm. uh, publishing traditionally belonged to small family firms, people like Roger Strauss or Alfred Knopf or Donald Klopfer and Bennett Cerf at Random House, uh, started firms with a relatively small amount of money. They built the firms up so that they were sizable and important. Um, but they were never major economic powers. They were not part of a large conglomerate. They were on their own. Mm -hmm. And uh, they managed to publish some of the great literature in our country. Yeah. Uh, in spite of that, or perhaps because of that, uh, Random House, for instance, had many started in the late, in the late 20s with the Modern Library, published Faulkner, published uh, uh, Sinclair Lewis, published some of the great names in American literature, John yeah. O'Hara and others. Yeah. Um, but like all the other independently owned publishing houses, uh, never made a huge amount of money. Uh, the, that was not the intention. The intention was really uh, to, uh, to publish, not to make money, but to make money in order to publish. So there was a kind of equilibrium between the realities of staying in business, of keeping things going, but also of publishing the books that you thought mattered. Was there a tradition of making money with certain books that would be, let's say, bestsellers or something, so that you then could have some to publish things that you might sure, want to Sure, very much so, very okay. much so. And one, okay. one book subsidized another. Yes. And also you took on an author like Faulkner, as Random House did, and you didn't say, well, we're just going to publish the bestsellers. Yes. We're going to publish the whole work. Right. And we're going right. to keep the books in print. And you had the ability to take that on. Right, exactly. Yeah, right. But there was a cost to that in sure. that publishing as a whole 
tended to make about a 4% profit at the end of the year huh. as an industry as a whole, which huh. is not much more than keeping your money in the savings bank. Yes, yes. On the other hand, the, the value of the firms gr grew enormously, yeah. um, and the, the small firm that uh, Random House had initially been ended up being sold to Newhouse uh, uh, some 10 years ago for $60 million. Not a bad sum, not a, a, an earth-shattering sum, but certainly enough to leave the people who had initially invested in it, uh, uh, well compensated for their work. Is that value of that? Is that is that in um, is that in capital? Is mm -hmm. that in re, uh, if I may, if you bear with me a little bit, sure. is that is that in uh, real estate? Is that in capital stock? Is that in printing equipment? Is that in contract? Is that in goodwill? Is that in patent rights? Where does the value come in terms of the publishing world? Primarily, I mean that right. it can be well, given the, a, an assigned value right. in some well, sort of a way value, because you're dealing with ephemeral intellectual property well, here in the end. Yes you know? and no. I no mean, okay. What you're dealing with is really what what the sales are. Okay. And uh, okay. firms tend to go for <coughs> the amount of books they sold in the preceding year, the, okay. the total amount, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, very often that's roughly going to determine the purchase price of the firm. Now, of course, you have books that you're in inventory, you've got contracts, you've got goodwill, you have all those other factors. Yes, um, but a lot of a lot of publishing is also determined on the hopes that money will be made in the future, that it'll fit in with the other firms that you have, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, but you can make an investment and then decide you no longer want to be in that area. For instance, the Newhouse people owned Condé Nast. Uh, they had bought the New Yorker. They owned a lot of cable television. They owned a lot of newspapers. They felt that it would be useful to have a publishing house to go along with that. Mm -hmm. And the idea was in part that one would feed the other, that material from the random house books would end up in the New Yorker, as indeed they do with great frequency, mm -hmm. or in Vogue or whatever. Yeah, and they could get synergies between So there was the feeling of synergy, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. uh, now, at some point, synergy begins to to violate what we used to think of as the antitrust act. Okay, uh, that's interesting. And, you know, that's, yeah, right. that's an important factor yes, because indeed. increasingly, as these large conglomerates have bought up publishing houses and fitted them in, mm -hmm. uh, Time Warner is more likely to publish, uh, publicize one of its books and to push the movie and the cable and so on and so yeah, forth and uh -huh. somebody else's. Right. So uh, Book of the Month Club, now owned by Time Warner, is more likely to choose a Time Warner book than a new press book or whatever the case may be. Yes. So you have all of these traditional patterns um, which uh, the antitrust people used to try to, to keep in check. Right. And this is growing. Yeah. Ben Bagdikian has written about yeah. the concentration of control. And this is a major control as we come into an information right. environment increasingly. The ownership, right, uh, the ownership of major conglomerates that are more and more controlling what people see, read, and have access to. Exactly, yeah. exactly. In fact, yeah. The Nation magazine the other week did a mm -hmm. special issue on, on the media, and they had a chart showing how the top eight firms now are in multi-billion dollar firms, uh, whether it's uh, Newhouse or Murdoch or Viacom or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, some of the German firms, some of the other foreign firms that are involved, Holtzbrink, Bertelsmann, uh, who have very, very substantial world holdings. Yeah. In fact, the people who run these firms tend to say, basically, by the year 2000 and whatever, yeah. uh, there'll be half a dozen major conglomerates left, and we will be one of those. Globally. Globally. And this, be, this global picture, we were talking yeah. earlier about a domestic market. We right. tend to think of that traditionally in days gone by and so forth, but it becomes yeah. increasingly a global pattern, right. doesn't it? Right. right, and people want yeah. to buy, and they do buy firms in all sorts of countries. Right. It allows them to some degree to diversify. A lot of these purchases, though, are sort of textbook monopolistic acquisitions. They, they are the kind of thing you're supposed to do. They're not necessarily the kind of thing that makes money. I see, right. And people like Bertelsmann, who are a huge mail-order firm that do door-to-door -door selling in a lot of countries, have a lot of music holdings and so on. Um, as far as we can see, their publishing on the whole has hardly made any money over the years. Uh -huh. But it's one of the holdings that they feel they ought to have uh -huh. because it's part of this pattern. If you're going to have a world communication a conglomerate, you want to have film, you want to have cable, you want to have all these things. Um, but to go back to what I was saying before about yeah. profit, mm -hmm. um, once you have these entities, you expect each of the components to make as much money. The profit as your, centers. The profit centers, right. Yeah. And therefore, you want to make as much money in your publishing as you do in your cable, as you do in your television, as oh. you do in, in the other media. And the one might have to answer to the needs of the other, or the inclinations, or the seeing possibilities of profit center of another part of the overall conglomerate that might take away from the independent view of the right. editors who make up right. that particular right. entity. Yeah. Right. And so what you've had is that 
uh, you know, the stock market more or less expects firms to make between 12 and 15, 16, 20 percent, mm -hmm. depending on the year, depending on the investment. Mm -hmm. So the publishing, which for many years had made this 4 percent profit, was suddenly expected to quadruple, quintuple uh, its expectations and its profit. How and can it do I, that? Well, it can't. And of oh, course, right. that's, that's the problem. Right. Uh -huh. uh, and what's happened, and this was behind the random house change, um, whole segments of what were traditional publishing have been jettisoned and uh, investments in other areas have been made in the hope of reaching these new profit expectations. Bear with me here if you would, Andrew, please. You know, you, see, you mentioned textbooks. That's a right. major captive audience, if mm. that's the right term or something, but that's a major part of the market. And then you say you have the traditional publishing. Mm -hmm. uh, when you say that, uh, and then you have trade publication, uh, can you break it down? What the, sure. the, pub the book publishing industry, well, what are the right. major components well, of that the, the, on a national and a world scale? Right, well you have, you have what you think of as trade publishing, which are the books that you find in the bookstore, the book a general person will want to read. Okay. You've got textbooks, school books, uh, high school. Those are two major. Uh, yeah. Which are major areas, and you have, um, you, all, you have uh, reference works, specialty works of, of different kinds, including right. CD-ROMs and so on and so forth. CD-ROMs. Right, I mean, that are That's linked, linked yeah. to books and so uh -huh. on and so forth. But I think the, the major divisions are within the nature of book publishing itself. Okay. That is to say, the, the firms like Random House, Harper's, whatever, um, would publish a full range. They would publish young authors whose names weren't known. They would publish first novelists. They would publish translations. They would publish poetry. They would publish art history. They would publish American history. They published a very wide range of books mm -hmm. uh, and try to make as much money as they could doing so. Yeah. But the criterion for each book was not, will it bring in a co specific contribution to overhead, a specific mm -hmm. contribution to profit at the end of the year. Uh -huh. The overall intent was to try to balance the books at the end of the year. Yeah. Uh, the new financial people, whether it's at Random House or Harper's or whatever, have a different attitude. Uh, they're saying that the, the firm as a whole has to contribute uh, so much money to the overall enterprise, and therefore you don't take on the smaller books. You don't take on the first novel. You don't take on a book that you don't think will sell 15,000, 20,000 copies or mm -hmm. whatever. And that tends to exclude most of what we used to think of as serious publishing. Right. The serious literary work, the poetry, uh, the serious historical, et cetera, et cetera. It, mm -hmm. uh, those have tended to go by the boards. Oh, that's a shame. It is a great shame. It's yeah. a great shame. And that's why, indeed, why we started the new press. Uh -huh. We felt that you ha we had to find a new structure where you could publish the books that seemed to matter, mm -hmm. uh, books that should be there because of their inherent worth, not because they were going to contribute enough to the corporate overhead. Yeah. So the solution that we came up with was to create a new genre, uh, which was a not-for-profit public interest publishing house. Well, not-for-profit public interest in other, publishing house. Right. right. In like, other words, we took the, 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 the mm -hmm. model, if you like, of NPR and PBS. Good. Uh, yeah, right. Right. Mm -hmm. And when Bill Moyers thought of the idea for PBS all those years ago, mm -hmm. a similar change had taken place within the broadcasting world. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're both of us old enough yeah, to remember yeah. when Edward R. Murrow would do his, his documentaries on television, when television had there. a full range, yeah, yeah, right. when, uh, when there was such a thing as Toscanini and mm. the NBC uh, uh, Symphony, which is an unthinkable concept now. Not to mention the show of shows. <laughs> right. right. But, I mean, think, think that yes. within our lifetime, yeah. uh, one of the major networks felt it had to have a symphony orchestra. Yes. Yes. And a world-class yes. conductor yes. for that. Right. Uh, all of that disappeared. Uh, right. And uh, when uh, Moyers, I think, in a very prescient way, looked at that, he said, "Look, we have to have a new structure. Mm -hmm. We have to have a, a group of people who are willing to broadcast what really matters, rather than that which will reach the maximum size of audience and therefore the, the best uh, sponsorship and the best income that way." We need something other than tabloid television. Exactly. Yes. So that's why uh, the initial vision, and I say the initial vision because PBS has altered somewhat since that time, mm -hmm. uh, was based on the idea of broadcasting precisely what uh, ought to be part of the culture, ought to be something that everybody in the rest of the country should have access to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and that was a public broadcast, not that it was right. public broadcast. So that was, and we have BBC tradition. We have right. other traditions right. of state supported Indeed. television and Europe, that's the, cultural the development in right. Europe. We have that right. kind of thing. We don't have that nearly enough here in the United no, States? No, we, we, we have, well, what we have much less of that. Yeah, right. uh, and uh, even in New York City, where mm. we've had WNYC all yes. these years, since mm -hmm. the 30s, as a, a city-owned <coughs> radio station, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, that's a tradition that's been endangered. Mm -hmm. um, looking back in history, it's worth noting 
uh, way back in the 20s when Herbert Hoover was not president but secretary of commerce. Mm -hmm. uh, he wanted broadcasting, the radio broadcasting industry that was just beginning to come into being, to be based in universities. Mm -hmm. And he was very prescient. He knew that unless you gave it a not-for-profit public interest setting, it would in time be taken over by, as he said then, Westinghouse mm -hmm. and GE, yeah. who indeed have come along and, and in time brought up much of broadcasting. Yeah. So Hoover uh, had the knowledge early, early on that something as crucial uh, to the culture as broadcasting had to be kept out of commercial hands or the whole nature of news in this country, the whole nature of diffusion of cultural information and products and so on would, would be undermined and endangered. And go the way it seems to be going and now. And go the way exactly it has say. gone. Right. Yeah. So he, he was very yeah. right. And exactly the same thing yeah. uh, can be said of publishing. Publishing was not started with the university setting except for the university presses. Well, the university presses exactly. are important. Right. They are important. Yeah. But, but unfortunately, important as they are, they still reach a very small very finite number of people. Right. The average sale for the average university press book these days is 650 copies. Oh, boy, that's like now Xeroxing. That, right. Well, now, yeah. that is not a criticism of the university yeah. presses. It's yeah. a criticism of the library budgets right. because we've taken away the money from the public libraries, from the university libraries, uh, from the universities in general that used to buy the books that made these presses viable. Mm -hmm. So that's all been a change. And, and what we've seen in the last few years is that publishing that used to be dominated by the family-owned firms, by the individually-owned firms, by the university presses, and so on and so forth, is now totally dominated by the conglomerate-controlled firms. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, so that you have a handful of independents that are left, and they can really be listed on the fingers of one hand. Uh -huh. You've got Norton, you've got Houghton Mifflin, you've got Workman, you've got a few other firms of some size uh -huh. and importance intellectually, but they're very, very few in number. Are they? Are those others that you mm. said? We want to talk about the new mm. press because you were able to get some support from some foundation people right. and that sort of thing. We want to talk right. about that. Are they um, in the marketplace wholly, or they get support such as that? Or is what you've done, new, mm. new press, where you've gotten support from... MacArthur and other foundation for it, I think, or right. others. Mm -hmm. uh, is that a pattern that we ought to think of in terms of publishing more, or is it a pattern that is existent within the publishing world maybe than I realize? Right. Well, the amount of variety left in publishing yeah. is, is very small. I know, um, I know. And it, it's like you want to preserve and, right. and, and foster and right. nurture it. Right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, all the independent presses together, all of the alternative presses, all the university presses, probably don't amount to 1% of your share of market altogether. Really? That's small. Right. And but so much of the relevant exactly. voice in the wilderness, right. things that might begin to pull us out of this yeah. nosedive, some see us in, are going to come from those places. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So right. if you look at the percentage of books that are reviewed by the Times and listed you know, at the yeah. end of the year as the yeah. best books or whatever, uh, disproportionate. It's not 1% at all that yeah. come from these other presses. It, it'll be much higher. Interesting. It'll right. be much higher. Uh -huh. um, our first year, for instance, we, we published a very small number of books. We had five books in fiction and belles lettres, uh -huh. every one of which ended up on the Times' list of the best books of the year. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Now, that was because we were free to choose the books that we thought really mattered yeah. rather than the books that we thought might be immediate bestsellers. Yeah, you would think quality yeah. would count at some point. Well, in all it, of this, it does right? to you know, some yeah. degree. But, yeah. but structure is yeah. very important. Okay. And if you don't have you know, the library systems that buy the books, yeah. you know, a lot of these smaller publishing houses are not going to be able to get across. Right. Uh, you need to have bookstores that are willing to push books from all the publishers, regardless of their potential sales. And you need and to have on. the publishers who have the, the knowledge right. and the ability to right. bring that part of right. the overall pattern, because it's not only just a matter of producing the book, it's also a matter of distribution and getting it out. Right. And, uh, exactly. You know, and exactly. that has to be part of the equation. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So the, the, the large houses, you know, still have the same staffs for the yeah. most part that they had a few years ago. Or maybe larger. Right. But mm -hmm. the people involved no longer have the same incentives. In uh -huh. fact, they have disincentives. They're told, yes, of course, it would be very nice to do this first novel, this work of history, etc., but we can't afford to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, Harold Evans, the head of the Random House Trade, and the other day, in fact, gave a speech in which he said all of the books that Random House had published that had been on the Times' list of best books that year mm -hmm. uh, had not made enough money. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, that's a quid accounting question. You know, yes. If your overheads are such, if you have executives making many millions of dollars, if you have a huge structure that is extremely expensive to maintain, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then simply paying your share of that overhead, if each book has to do so, mm -hmm. will preclude the publication of a lot of important books. Those limousines get expensive. They get very and the expensive. the Learjet's even more. Right, and, mm -hmm. there, and there are mm -hmm. more and more of them. Yes, indeed. Uh, while at the same time, there are people who have argued uh, convincingly in publishing that 
you know, as long as you have books that are going to be paying your basic costs, if you publish another 10 works of poetry or fiction or whatever beyond that, those mm -hmm. books are really not going to cost you anything beyond the paper and the printing. I'm really struck by the fact mm -hmm. that you said so many of the books that are coming from this relatively small segment mm -hmm. of the publishing industry are the books that really matter. You right. know, we can say books that matter or thoughts that matter. Mm -hmm. uh, they come from there, and uh, there, there's an overarching societal interest in trying to uh, maintain the, 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 the capability of our being able right. to access to that thought and, and process. Exactly. It, exactly. It's not just only a business decision. It's a, it's a thought for public policy, perhaps? Or, of course, of course. Uh, you know, if social we, concern. Yeah. If we were all just manufacturing blue jeans, yes. and, and suddenly you had only three kinds of blue jeans available so, in the market, the country wouldn't fall apart. Right. But if you have only three kinds of ideas Absolutely. available, uh, then you're not going to have the choice in the debate. Particularly as we come into an information environment again. Exactly. It feeds back into the economic right. construction. And this has been one of the great changes that has taken place, and yes. that is one of the reasons for which we started the new press, mm -hmm. is that the number of books available on the social issues, on the major uh, debates of, of the time, on the issues facing Congress and so on, are diminishing in every year. It used to be a tradition in American publishing from my childhood on uh, that there would be election year books. Uh, there would be books on, you know, do we need a different kind of health care system? Do we need uh, these multinational uh, trade agreements, et cetera? What are the costs going to be and so on and so forth? It's interesting if you look back, if you look back on 92, 96 on those presidential elections, right. there are very, very few books published for the general reader. I'm not talking about university press books, but I think of books that address the general reader and said, these are issues that are facing the society. These are the facts that you need to know, because publishers were much more reluctant to do those. They were self-published by people like Mr. Perot. They right. Do well, it. You was know, that. vanity. And there that. was that. But, yeah. there, but there was a dual pressure. There yeah. was the pressure that, you know, in an age of, of increasing conformity yeah. and the lack of debate on television and right. so on, mm -hmm. uh, there's less of a ready market. <coughs> Uh, but you can say that publishing only for the available for a pre-existing market is a form of censorship. Yeah, absolutely, you're not absolutely. going to have a market for new ideas by That's definition. Right. Uh, so again, this has been part of the challenge of the new press. The, the Random House people. One of the reasons that we left was that they said, you know, stop publishing all these political books with new ideas and so on. They're not going to sell enough, and I think it's understood they're not going to sell owners group. enough. Yeah. And mm. so, uh, you know, uh, they wanted the, the the Dick Morrises and so on, so right, forth, right. which would sell many more copies. There's a sort uh, of self-fulfilling prophecy. It is. Well, that, well that, that, which is very dangerous. Right. Well, that's we all ought to be required huh. to read Mr. Orwell every right. six months or so. Right. Yeah. Well, one of the uh, one of the Spanish newspapers describing all of this called it market censorship, uh -huh, which, is right. not, which is not a bad Or Noam phrase. Chomsky would call it manufacturing right, consent, yeah, a book particularly which, uh, A book Harrison. we published many years ago. Oh, you did publish. Congratulations. Right. Uh, <laughs> but, a, but a book that, that would not appear there now, clearly. Really? Uh, you know, not under the current, right, I see. Right. Right. But that, now, where would a book mm. such as manufacturing consent appear well, nowadays? Well, uh, inc or, increasingly, uh, yeah. the, the people who are publishing this kind of book, apart from the new press, yeah. are smaller, independent, alternative presses. Now, are they, there are is they, a proliferation of those. Oh, there are a proliferation, mm -hmm. and are they able to, let's say we said before, there's more to do than publishing the book, because we now, now we live also, let's mm -hmm. back off a little, we live in the internet age. We mm -hmm. live in an age where there's a great deal of um, keyboarding going on, a great mm -hmm. deal of things being put down mm -hmm. on paper and so forth, but there is the importance that the ideas not only be there, but that the ideas also be able to be, uh, the, the capability of the people who help put that together to reach an appropriate audience, and so that it has some gravitas, so that it has some, you know, some gravitas, so that it can have an effect upon the society. That's an important equation. Are these people who would publish that kind of a book now mm. able to do that? Are they, are they being, in your view, and in your experience, mm. in your, you know, are, are they being, hopelessly marginalized? Or what is the situation? Well, a, what do you think? Right. Well, for the voice in the wilderness, mm -hmm. voices that might really make a difference, or the, the voices that do make a difference. Mr. Blake had to publish himself, mm. William Blake. Yeah. But, you know, there's a danger there, there of is. our losing the voices that might be the voices right. of our own salvation. Right. And we, you get a little over dramatic, but you understand what I'm sure, saying? Sure, sure. Yeah. And, I, and I agree. I mean, we are mm -hmm. losing a great many of them. I think if you look just Shitty. objectively at the number of books if you, uh, that are appearing in given areas, you'll see that there are fewer of those. And the books that are published by the smaller presses, uh, in politics, it's Common Courage, and South End, and Verso, and Routledge, and Ourselves, and so on and so forth. These are not household names, mm. and they're not books that you'll find in every bookstore in any quantity. They're not books that'll have the budgets to buy full-page ads in the Times, and so on and so forth. So the chances that people will know about them are lessened. They're not, they're not 
completely eliminated. You know, the papers are increasingly reviewing books from the smaller presses. The but papers, when we say the, the papers, are we talking, we talk New York Review of Books, New York Times Book Review, and are there a few from the publishing, uh, the right. I mean, there pub are, Publishers Weekly? Or, right, well, there are, you well, know, Publishers Weekly is supposed to review everything, so. Uh, See, I'm, I'm not familiar right. with that, but how a thing is launched and put out into the world where it begins to get its own legs. You know? Right, well, increasingly, that is a question of having enough money to do that, to okay. send the author around the bookstores on a national tour to get them on talk shows, right. uh, to ha have ads, and, of course, to, ha to have books be reviewed. But the yeah. New York Times Book Review will review, what, 20 books, maybe 25 books at most a year. Yes. There are 50,000 books a year published oh, in this country. There are, 50,000. Right. So yeah, okay. you're talking about uh -huh. you know, 1,000 books being reviewed by the Times, or perhaps a little bit more, yeah. in 5% uh, of the total. Right, okay, uh, interesting The figures. New York Review will review even fewer mm -hmm. of those. And they tend to be by authors who are more familiar to the New York Review reader and, yeah. and, and the, the chance of a newer book, newer author being recognized by, by them is not, is not as great. Uh -huh. um, so there are fewer places for books to be reviewed. There are fewer places for people to talk about them, mm -hmm. um, which is why the efforts, particularly of the independent bookstores, to have uh, authors come and talk and so on is, is very important. Yes. Uh, but all of that takes money to send, yeah. you know, if, you, if you're sending an author across the country, yes. uh, a budget for that will be thirty, forty thousand dollars 40000 which a lot sure. of people can't afford sure. if they're publishing four or 5,000 copies of the book. Yes, yeah, right. Uh, so there is, yeah. a, there is a concentration of, of, of uh, power in the larger firms who are able to send Dick Morris from coast to coast. I suppose it's so always on. been a problem mm -hmm. for the money and the thing. It's probably always been there. Like we said, William Blake had to do right. his own engravings and so forth right. and so forth. They had a property there. Shakespeare, I guess, mm -hmm. made his way all right. That kind mm -hmm. of thing has always been a problem. But it's coming into a new kind of past now, it right. seems to me, to where the intellectual integrity of the society perhaps is being really threatened by these overweening economic concerns. Right. Right, and you all, there are two factors. I mean, one is the, the problem of concentration of globalization and so on and so forth, mm -hmm. which has its own momentum. The other is that of the politicization of the large firms by their owners. Right. In other words, Murdoch uh, will not be publishing at Harper in England or here uh, books that are arguing causes that he disagrees with. He, he's a very conservative man. He's very open about it. He pays for the Weekly Standard and other places. Uh, that espouse the far right viewpoints, and he has not encouraged uh, his publishing houses to come out with views with which he disagrees. Now, what do you think of that? Do you think that's a good thing or bad? Should there be people that have mm. that kind of a view? Or well, I think that it shows. And then there should be an intervening one that. Right, but you know, very, if somebody's a Marxist, they should right. do that. Right. Well, it's very hard to yeah. find a Marxist uh, who's uh, owning an international media conglomerate yeah, right, at this right, point, right, or indeed yeah. a liberal. Right. Okay. Uh, so people with a lot of money tend yeah. to want to keep it. Uh -huh. and tend to disagree with uh, policy, social policies that will keep them from keeping it or it will keep them from making more. Uh -huh. uh, Murdoch gained a certain amount of notoriety last year when one of his publishing houses published a biography of Dong Xiaoping mm -hmm. by, by uh, Dong's daughter. Mm -hmm. And it was a book which had no intellectual merit whatsoever. And yet um, Harper and Collins spent over $100,000 bringing her over to this country to publicize the book and push it and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, at first people said, now why are they publishing this book? There's no audience for this book in this country whatsoever. Mm -hmm. It became very clear that the reason was that uh, Murdoch wanted the Sky Channel to yeah. have access to, right. to, to the People's Republic. He'd already made the necessary promises to the Chinese government that he wouldn't let the BBC on, that he would censor the broadcast and so on and so forth. But this was a way of showing a little added friendship done, and yeah. uh, right. spending a little extra money uh, to show that he was willing to kiss Dong's ass yes, in, in right, this right, way. Right, 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 right. Um, and in a way, we have to be grateful that in, in the 1930s, uh, the media conglomerates of the time were not trying to do the same thing with Hitler, or we oh. would have had a lot of very friendly books appearing in, the, in well these taken. countries Point in, well in that way. Yeah, right. um, so that, that's an important factor. Yes. You also have the factor, and again, I'll, uh, these are the ones that are written about the most, uh, so I'll, I'll mention them in the case of Murdoch, was the famous four and a half million dollar advance offered to, uh, to Gingrich. Yeah. Um, now, because of the, of the re reasonable uh, objections of the time that congressmen are not supposed to make a fortune while they're, they're at least uh, in Congress, um, that was uh, reduced <laughs> to simply paying him his royalties. Yes. Um, 
It's inter- becoming laughable. It's, I'm it's, sorry. It's becoming it laughable. Is, it, it, is so, it, it is so. It but, is so. But you know, I think with all the complaints corrupt, about yeah. Clinton and yeah. company, it's, yeah. it's interesting to look that the, the press on the whole did not look and say, well, how much did that book earn? Yeah. Well, the book earned roughly a third of what the advance had been. Huh. Uh, so that there was a three million dollar tip in mm. effect, being given to Gingrich. Mm. Um, and though Murdoch himself may not have been the man presenting the check, mm. he was certainly talking to Gingrich even before the contract was signed. And that had all kinds of political implications right, to get to yeah. get more TV franchises and so on in the cities that he was interested in. Right. So yeah. you have this yeah. very important change that the people who own the conglomerates mm-hmm. have interests that go beyond books. Uh-huh. They uh-huh. have financial interests, they have global interests, they have needs for which they want political support, uh-huh. and therefore they will use the money that they have, Mm -hmm. they will use the clout, which is very considerable they have, they will use the media that they have Mm -hmm. to reinforce the power of those people who are in office Mm -hmm. and who uh, in turn uh, will be the ones uh, who will uh, keep them in in clover. Uh, It's interesting you say the thing is becoming laughable, but we tend to forget that all of this money that's been, all this bribery that's been going on has let's be fair, an objective situation. The politicians need money to buy airtime. Yeah. Mm. Now, why do they need money to buy airtime? The air is the only... keep power. No, no, but the air is the only resource in this country that's still nationalized. It still belongs to the people. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be free. Supposed to be. Right. The FTC is supposed to guarantee equal equal and fair Mm. use of the airways. Mm -hmm. Uh, We are spending a vast amount of money corrupting a vast number of politicians Mm. in order to allow them to buy something which is supposed to be ours to begin with. Well, I'm saying we need the Marx Brothers, or we need mm. some, I mean, it's becoming almost, you know, is it, is it something we should, I mean, you know, ridicule mm. or laughter or something? It's just beyond, well, you know, we need, we need Jonathan Swift. We need, uh, mm. Defo- you know, we need mm. something to try and, br- the reality into... Right. Uh, into right, but you also needed a lot of books published in the last few years about this, which you haven't had. Yes, exactly. And, All right, right, and right. So, okay. And so you do have you know, the fox and the chicken coop, you've yeah. got the fox in the publishing house yeah. uh, saying, well, these are not books we're going to allow to go through because right. they're directly challenging. You don't writers. think it's catching up in the public consciousness? Yes, now? I, Maybe think, it's I think in to? this case because of the other media. Certainly yeah. there is a debate. I wanted to ask you about right. that. And we've had also over the year, you said, the fe- you know, antitrust. We have Federal Trade Committee. We had, you know, National Labor Relations Standard, mm-hmm. Labor Relations Standard. We've had FCC. We have had other things. In publishing, has there been, has there been any, or let's say in the, the media, and now we're coming into an information environment where all of the electronic media and the traditional media are, 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 are conglomerate, become conglomerated and so forth, and, is there, and globally. Is there any agency that could put any, or is there the point of us thinking in any kind of a antitrust rationale or any kind of a quasi-social policy kind of thing that could begin to be encouraging the citizenry to begin to uh, encourage something to be able to stave off the the worst effects of a of, right. a, of a hopelessly uh, of you know, concentrated of course. But you're descri- propagandized right. media information system. But you're describing a classic catch twenty two situation because the very media that are supposed to awaken public interest are the very ones that are controlled by the people who don't want this to happen. So you're not... You, know, you mean even the government agencies? Well, no, the government agencies are, uh, are under strong pressure from, from very them. powerful forces. Yes, right. And uh, no one in Congress has this year or in the, pre- the White House has been willing to challenge these people uh, to say, okay, we're going to t- stop paying you money for something that belongs to us right. because they're afraid of the impact it would have if the media turned against them. Yes, right. Now, obviously, if the Antitrust Act had been had been applied in a lot of these cases, those conglomerates would not have been built up to begin with. Yeah, all right, okay. Uh, and a few years ago, that would not have been the case. Yeah. Um, I'll give you an example that when, when Random House uh, bought Knopf mm. uh, in 1961, that made the front page of the New York Times. Mm-hmm. And the Department of Justice, the anti-monopoly division, mm-hmm. called up the next day, Bennett Cerf used to tell the story, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, say, we want to look into this acquisition. It says, how much is this new monopoly worth? And mm-hmm. Bennett said, well, it's uh, seven million for Random and six million for Knopf and a million for Pantheon. It'd be about 15 million altogether. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the man of the antitrust division said, well, why were you guys on the front page of the Times? Yeah. Uh, and of course, that's a reasonable question at that time. Now, conglomerations <coughs> take place that, that 
change billions of dollars of holdings uh -huh. without any phone calls from the antitrust right. division or, or any political pressure to diversify uh -huh. or to keep these accretions of power from taking yeah. place. Things have changed so quickly. We're coming into a world, intellectually, they're trying to get a handle on it. Mark Perrot and some of these other people. We've gone, uh, we had Neolithic agriculture, we had an agri you know, industrial revolution, and now we're trying to get a, some sort of an understanding of what is sometimes called postmodernist world, or some people, they say it's an information environment that uh -huh. we're coming into. Was there any kind of um, um, uh, 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 difficulties in terms of trying to bring some sort of uh, social polity or social uh, uh, control or social thought to these issues of information or, or publishing or electronic and other because of certain notions of, of um, freedom of the press or certain kinds of uh, thoughts where they are not going to do any kind of uh, violation of the free operation of the people who operate these things, a special nature that wouldn't apply, say, if it were in the case of steel or automobiles mm -hmm. or something from the industrial era, that there's a special ability for people to conglomerate in the area of information, mm -hmm. uh, concentration of control of information because of certain kind of traditional views of freedom of expression yes. that gave them advantages that they were able to use to their advantage, perhaps to the disadvantage of the overall social mm -hmm. organization. Well, Do there, you understand what I'm saying? I, I see what you're, you're saying, yes, and I think there may have been instances where people were saying, well, you know, we shouldn't go after so-and-so because it may look as if we're attacking their freedom of expression. Yeah. But in, in reality... the Supreme Court has given some decisions right. that have been a little bit uh, discouraging or a little bit... Well, uh, but, you know, mo most of the existing laws, the laws yeah. that are being violated, were laws that were meant to, pr pr you know, to prevent con these kinds of concentrations. I mean, yeah. it, you did not used to ha have the power to buy a major TV station and a newspaper in the same that's city. That's right, cross-ownership. Right. Yeah. And yet, that's exactly what Murdoch was able to do. Absolutely. Uh, and now. part of it is simply by using power to gain power. In mm -hmm. the case of England, uh, he offered the support of the London Times to Margaret Thatcher mm -hmm. if Margaret Thatcher would waive the monopoly laws which allowed him to buy the Times of London, uh -huh. which, of course, she did. Right. Uh, now, now that Murdoch sees the Blair coming in and may support Blair, yeah. uh, they may regret having made that decision. Uh -huh. uh, but nonetheless, they did make that decision. It was yeah. a re relatively straightforward exchange. Yeah. You help, you scratch our back and waive the law, uh -huh. and we will scratch yours uh -huh. uh, in the elections to come. So it isn't as if these are, uh, you know, people who are th trying very hard to sell their pamphlet on the street corner. Yes, right. Uh, mm -hmm. th th we're talking about major con concentrations of I know. Power. I, was, I was thinking, yeah. I think perhaps they use that to their mm -hmm. advantage. Some of, of this argumentation of to course. their advantage, yeah. saying we are selling pamphlets at Hyde Park, yeah. and really, they were using it to their right. advantage. But, th but those issues... Because they seem to have gotten such a jump on it. Right, know? but I think it hasn't been by using First Amendment arguments. Okay. It's been by using simple power. Yeah, uh, okay. And okay. Uh, either the threat or the blandishment that comes with owning all the media. Right, that right. People want and that, that tendency, unfortunately, is still a glomerate. Mm -hmm. There's still a glomerate. It's still it's, concentrating. It's As getting, Ben Bagdick sure. has done well to show us. It's so. getting stronger and stronger. And if you, if Very you, disquieting, if you yeah. look at the nation chart, you'll see that we're talking about holdings that internationally are worth in the tens of billions of dollars right. Uh, right. and have these enormous right. uh, controls over over the media. And and those econo those, yeah. those information yeah. questions are becoming more and more a part of, uh, of the national economy, as it were. I mean, we had publishing apart, but the big industries were, um, you know, steel, automobiles, uh, these kind of things. Yeah. But the information, and, and particularly now we're coming into the Internet, we've got Microsoft, we've got these other kinds of things that are developing. These intellectual questions or these intellectual right. uh, entities are becoming more and more important. Right. Right. Uh, a countervailing threat or a countervailing force or a mm -hmm. countervailing tendency is the new press, right? I mean, we've talked, you talked about right. you were involved with it. Um, You've gone that way, and you, you're, so you're, in a certain sense, fighting against the tide. Yes, indeed. And indeed. it's a uphill battle, or I don't know, how, what metaphor? Well, Salmon <laughs> swimming up against the stream, or what metaphors well, can we, we use? Or let's how say we're, we're counter-cyclical. Yeah, we're, okay. Right. We're, we're trying to, to go against the, the trend, certainly, and, yeah. and to show, and I think we have shown in these five years, that you can publish books that are raising questions that others aren't, that you can publish authors that other people have said no one will buy, et cetera, et cetera and that you can reach an audience, sometimes a very substantial one. And mm -hmm. As I said, some of our books have become bestsellers. Others have done far better than anyone ever thought they would. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's important for the booksellers, it's important for the media, it's important indeed uh, for other publishers to see uh, that you can still take these risks when they're free to do so. 
Now, not everyone is able to, to say to their owner, look, the new press had success here. Yeah. Uh, why don't we try and do the same? Uh -huh. But I think it's people tend to rationalize their positions. They tend to say, oh, well, we really can't publish translations from other languages anymore because those books aren't going to sell. Right. Or we can't do serious history anymore because no one's going to be interested and so on and so forth. And part of our task has been to show that that is not indeed the case. Okay. Um, I can give you an Thank goodness. Yeah. I can give you a simple example. We published an interesting book last year with the intriguing title of Lies My Teacher Told Me. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And it, what it was was a relatively specialized book uh, looking at the 11 most widely assigned high school American history textbooks and seeing what were the myths that we were conveying to our children, what, what were the distortions, what were the, Pretty looking, good. the gaps, and so on yeah, and so forth, right. written by a young professor at Vermont called Jim Lowen. Uh -huh. uh, and the book was a very entertaining, very well-written book. And it was said lies. Lies. Not, not misunderstanding. No, no, understanding. just out, not lies. Yeah, I, think, right, right. I think the right. title helped to sell the yes, book. Right, yeah. uh, but nonetheless, it was a specialized book. It was over 400 pages. It took a lot of reading right. to get through it. And we published some 7,500 copies, and which is a, a, a good, small size printing. Right. and said, if we sell these out, we'll be very happy, and yeah. the author will be very happy. Sure. And Book of the Month Club took a few copies, and by, by the end of the year, between the club and ourselves, we'd sold over 100,000 copies. Wow, really? 100,000, uh, yeah. Now, this was partly because the author went out on, on the road and talked to people and explained right. what the book was about. Some of the, a lot of the media were interested and so on and so forth. Uh -huh. But here is a book that most commercial publishers wouldn't have looked at, wouldn't have said, now, they this would, is worth trying yeah. out because they, it's never going to sell enough copies. They wouldn't have looked at it, they wouldn't have looked at it because it would uh, not, it would have been perceived by them that it would not sell. Right. Is that, what the, is by, that, the, is that the no, bottom line that thing? Is, totally is it, is it line, ever yeah. ideological where they won't sell yes. it because it doesn't I mean, they're presenting philosophical, or economic, or thought patterns that they think are subversive of the way the social or organization right. of the society ought to be, and they won't do it for those kind of reasons. Right. I think you have Or one right. other is, if something is uh, of a literary quality, mm -hmm. a li high literary, uh, James Joyce had trouble. No. They, why does he not speak in simple declarative sentences right. and so forth at the beginning? They just couldn't see it. Is that, is that another area of censorship? Right. You, you, ha you, you, have, you have the two jointly. You have okay. the commercial assumption that certain books are too difficult, too demanding, too esoteric, whatever, uh -huh. too out of sync with the times, mm. uh, that people will not buy them, and so you don't publish them. Uh, the other is that there is the knowledge in many of these firms that the owners, whether they're Newhouse or, or Murdoch or others, don't really look favorably on publishing books that are going to challenge uh, the way in which they work and the, the environments that they've helped to create. And so there is more reluctance. Somebody will say, well, somebody else can do that. You know, Harper is not going to publish an expose of Murdoch. Random is not going to publish an expose of Newhouse. But at the same time, when you go along, along further and you look at the changes of the last few years, both of those firms that used to be the bulwark of liberal publishing in this country mm -hmm. uh, are, no, are publishing primarily conservative books at this point. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, they will argue that it's the times have changed and so on, that they're only conservatives buying books and so on. But we, we have shown with the new press, and I think it's common sense, that the country hasn't changed that much, that there is still an audience on both sides of the fence, mm -hmm. and that you can publish profitably for both. But, what? Mm -hmm. No, but I'm saying yeah. what we're dealing with is both the, the, the assumptions that people have and the knowledge that, you know, uh, really our owners are not really looking for this kind of book, and that makes a fact, that's a factor that matters. What about a time when you have a convergence, and we, there's so many things to talk about, mm -hmm. but when you, have a, when you have a convergence of so many things going on now, um, Things are moving so quickly, I suppose mm. people have always felt, but in true sense, things are moving. If you take a, uh, I, I've used the analogy of used 200,000 years ago, apparently Homo sapiens sapiens appears, and if you, if you take that chart again, and, and I don't think we've changed biologically that much from Cro-Magnon days or something, but if you, if you were to take this chart like this, uh, uh, I don't think biologically we've changed that much, but if you were to take the technological extensions of consciousness and put it on a chart, it almost goes not even hyperbolic anymore in the time in which we talk mm -hmm. in this hundred years. It's almost L-shaped. There's mm -hmm. something going on at this time in terms of technology and the, and the information and the thing that is going on. If, um, if you get to a point like Bucky Fuller used to talk about or others who were visionaries of the time, which we're getting, you get to the point where you, in a certain sense, have answers to a situation that uh, collectively the human society is in that do not fit nicely into either the traditional left wing, right wing, or the dialectic, or the history, or it's a visionary overview of things that begins to incorporate all of those that might have, that don't fit nicely into either your traditional right wing, left wing, or those kind of things, but actually is in a systems way sort of encompassing a lot of those. 
are, are those books, uh, uh, books that, uh, you know, from George Bush once derided the concept of the visionary thing, our visionaries, mm. our Blakes, or our what, are, are those books that particularly are important uh, going to be perhaps not able to find a niche and be lost? Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Or sure, something sure. Something that is, in a certain sense, truly uh, a visionary work that might be really fundamentally right. important right. to helping to make a major change. Right, you know? right. Well, I think that's, that's very true, and I think you do have the problem that everyone who believes in the market and in the ideology of this new uh, structure is that the market will take care of things. Uh, you know, assume, uh, I think wrongly, uh, that, uh, that if people don't want to buy something, it's not, it's not worth doing. So okay. that new ideas, your William Blakes or your James Joyce's or mm. whatever, at the outset are not going to have a ready market, and you have to be willing to have, a, to have uh, the vision to publish the visionaries and to say, well, these are different ways the of The vision looking. to publish the visionaries, right. that's it, right. right. Uh, so that uh, criticism of any kind is very hard to get about. Mm -hmm. uh, we've just published a, a marvelous book by Ada Louise Huxtable called yes. Unreal America. Mm -hmm. And the New York Times last Sunday devoted the front of its uh, arts and leisure section to an excerpt from the book yes. um, with its criticism of the Disneyfication of American architecture and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, well, as it happens, the New York Times next Sunday has a long review attacking Ada Louise and saying, what's wrong with Disneyfication, basically? Mm -hmm. uh, now, here is one of our leading architectural critics who was trying to say, we're commercializing our whole atmosphere. Right. We're creating a fake environment. We're, yeah. we're disrupting the whole tradition of what the country's architecture should be about in order yeah. to, to make shopping malls and so on and so yeah. forth, uh, which is an important critique. Absolutely. All right. Now, that is not a book that would have been published by any major commercial house at this point, right. because they would say, this is not going to sell enough copies. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. she may be visionary she may be right and so uh -huh. on and so forth but the number of people who are interested in architecture yeah. and social yeah. issues relating to it are too small to justify our publishing of this book yeah. and in that respect they would they would be correct uh -huh. I mean the, the first printing of a book of this kind is well under the threshold that the commercial houses insist upon uh, how can we do it where the where we can have visionary publishers who can publish and afford to publish the visionaries well there and, are, and may I ask mm -hmm. you you have gotten some uh, underpinnings to what right. you're trying to do. And is that not an important development as it, far as the new press? Well, it, it we certainly, you know, if we had, when we had offers of, of private capital and so yeah, on, right. when we started out, mm -hmm. had we taken that money, we would have had to concentrate entirely on publishing books that would have paid back that mer that investment capital within the first three years, which is the way things go. Uh, first and in three years, that's yes, pretty quick. Th that's yeah, what, right. that's what in, uh, investment capital expects these days. Mm. Um, so there's no way we could have published any of the, the serious books that we're doing right. uh, with, with that in mind. Okay. Uh, so what we did was to go to a, a group of, of foundations and say, would you like to be our venture capital? Would you be willing to help fund us in the way that you initially helped to fund PBS and NPR? Why not? That's a beautiful analysis. Well, in that's the that, PBS exactly. is uh, exactly. what's worth seeing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's how we were able to get off the ground. Uh -huh. And now most of our books cover their costs, and, uh, and we have a scholarship fund, as it were, Good. for the books that, that won't. Mm -hmm. In other words, we feel that a book is admitted to our catalog on its merit, mm -hmm. not on its potential contribution mm -hmm. to our overhead and to our potential profit. Uh -huh. And as a result, we can publish the Ada Louise Huxtables. We can publish major translations from Europe and Asia. We can publish books on American history and social issues uh -huh. that other people are going to refuse to publish, uh, not because those books wouldn't have broken even, uh, that's not the argument against them, it's that they're not going to make enough money, yeah. both right, to pay these see. inflated overheads right. and to contribute to the very high profit expectations <laughs> of the new owners. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So basically what you've done is you've taken a whole field which used to be true of publishing, of newspapers, of magazines and so on, all of the media, which were not meant to be major industrial investments. You mm -hmm. didn't need that much money to get into publishing. Mm -hmm. You didn't need that much money to start a local newspaper. Mm -hmm. You were able to do it with family money. You were mm -hmm. able to do it with small shareholding. You were able to do it with basically the structure of 19th century capitalism. Mm -hmm. And that meant that people who did that did it because they wanted to do it, mm -hmm. not because they were trying to maximize their income because mm -hmm. they would have invested it elsewhere had they wanted to do that. Yeah, well, there's a certain noble quality to that. Well, that was, you yeah. know, that was the, the yeah, idea. That's right. why publishing was one of the liberal professions. Sure. And the same was true of lawyers and doctors and university teachers and, and right. others. Um, and I, I can tell you that uh, the other day I gave a talk to my 40th reunion, my Yale 40th reunion in New York mm. the other day. And I said I, <laughs> I was curious to know how many of my classmates had found the same problems 
uh, that I was talking about in publishing in their other professions. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the end, and during the conversation, a whole bunch of people who were lawyers, who were doctors, who were teachers, all came up to me and said, you know, w what you're talking about in publishing is happening in the rest of the society. Well, there. Money is determining right. everything. Yeah. Uh, and whether it's a, 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 law, a partner in a law firm who's been making a million bucks a year mm -hmm. and is suddenly told he's not bringing in enough income for the firm and he's going to have to take early right. retirement, mm -hmm. or a doctor who's told that his patient can't have this treatment because the insurance right. company's profit is not going to allow that to happen, yeah. or a university professor who's told by the university, sorry, your subject is no longer profitable enough to teach, mm -hmm. we're going to have to eliminate it or amalgamate it with another department or whatever. Yeah. The whole concept of money ruling our society mm -hmm. has now reached out from iron and steel, yeah. etc., to what used to be the liberal professions. Right, right, right. So that you used to have a whole group of people in the society, publishers were not the only ones, mm -hmm. who went into a field because they believed in it, right. not because they wanted to make as much money as possible, right. but because they were interested in the law, in medicine or teaching or whatever. Right and where they were willing to make somewhat less money and to have a career that was satisfying to them. As long as they them, had a competence. Because they, they could, could do, yes. exactly, because uh -huh. they wanted to do uh, what mattered to them. Yes. And now all of these professions, I think, are in danger in the same way, exactly. Yeah, it's being corrupted and the society's been right. corrupted, by right. this, which means that it really is going to have to be in some sort of a way dealt with if we're going to come out of this uh, nosedive, if that's the right mm -hmm. term, that we seem to uh, to be in there. If there's a thing that, you know, the publishing, getting the ideas out. Uh, you have this ability to put a book out and you're doing this. Are there others following in that or trying to do it? Or is there, is there a, a thought for us to, the foundations, how far can they go? in that direction. Is there any thought in there being public support? There's public television. Right. Although well, that's being well, that's threatened being now, cut back. Isn't it? And, you know, and, and everything's right. being threatened back. And this so, is not the time to go to the NEA and ask for some not of exactly, that, right. from yeah. that a small pot of, a dwindling pot of money. Mm. But certainly there used to be public support in all sorts of ways. Mm -hmm. And we, we tend not to think of how broad that support was. But it was support for libraries, it was support for schools. Exactly, public it, libraries. It was yeah. support for museums, it right. was support for um, the mailing costs of books which were underwritten and so on and so forth, yeah. uh, so that there was a very considerable budget which went towards cultural support. Yeah. Now, probably much more money used to go towards uh, helping the, the, the postal bills of Cosmopolitan or Playboy yes. uh, than of, uh, of all the literary yes, publications right, together. Right. Uh, so it wasn't a purely cultural budget, but mm -hmm. it was a budget that was aimed at helping all these folks. And the NEA and the NEH helped people to write the books and to, to do the work, as did, the, as did uh, the universities and so on. Now, all of that has been attacked and decimated in recent years, mm -hmm. so that the whole infrastructure support has been challenged. Uh -huh. So book publishing is really just a microcosm of the changes. But, but the key to, to publishing or into the other media is that those are the people who are supposed to be discussing all of these Absolutely. issues. They're the ones who are supposed to be having this conversation. They're they are much publishing like, books saying, you know, this ought not to be happening. Yeah, the antenna of the race in a certain sense. Well, artists have been by mm. called that by pond, mm. I think, mm. I'm not sure. But they have intended to try and pick up on the ideas that really do make a difference because so much of it doesn't. Um, we're coming increasingly into an electronic world. We do have uh, C-SPAN. Mm on our cable systems and so forth now. Brian Lamb brought that together. One aspect of which I'm sure you've noticed is they've got this increasingly. They had a book, uh, book notes, now mm -hmm. they call it. Right. They had, uh, they, they've increased the concern where they're taking more and more time in that C-SPAN model to discuss uh, books. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think of that? And the, the between, let's say, then we're in cable television here, between cable television and publishing and, uh, you know, larger entities in cable, but mm -hmm. between the electronic media and, and publishing itself in terms of being able to get a milieu where important ideas might be able to be put out and get abroad. Right. Well, it's certainly the potential is there, but the example you give is the only one you can cite. I'm sorry. And uh, <laughs> there should be there should be many more. Lewis Lapin tried. Right. In public right. television right. for but, a while, he had that but book it, it didn't work. You see, yeah. and I yeah. think it is amazing that you, apart from the miracle of Oprah mm -hmm. and and her monthly discussion, that there are no programs that do this on a regular basis. Now, one of the most popular shows in France for many years w was uh, the show that discussed issues of new books and authors and so on, and I, uh, Pivot's program. And I remember sitting in on some of those shows in Paris, and not only would they talk about a bestseller, but they would have a half hour devoted to new books of poetry. Mm -hmm. Was uh, that commercially supported? Or uh, was that no, that was system? part of the state system. State system right. And of course, having yeah. that infrastructure uh -huh. is absolutely central, just yeah. as the BBC used to read from books at night and so yes, on and so right. forth. Yeah. Um, so 
one of the difficulties that we've had with the mass media is mm -hmm. that enormous of the potential may be mm -hmm. uh, for discussion, just as you know, there's no reason why you can't have uh, the best of the film classics being shown constantly, which the, uh, New York is available only on CUNY TV one, one time a week, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. Um, you know, the, there is a, a dis discrepancy between the technological possibility and the actual fa uh, situation mm -hmm. that we mm -hmm. face. Um, and that's, you know, that's going to become a more and more serious thing. It is, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and indeed, you know, you, uh, valuable as C-SPAN is, and they've covered a lot of the conferences that we've done around our books. They've covered some of the uh, lectures that we've turned into books and so on, and they've been very, very, very valuable. Mm -hmm. um, still, there is less on C-SPAN discussing these, these issues, these media issues, these controversies and so on, than you would like to see. Uh, Maurice Papert and others want to do a C-SPAN of the world uh, mm -hmm. for the UN. There's mm -hmm. some others who are interested in trying to do, there's tremendously interesting mm -hmm. things going on at the UN. There could be a UN uh, uh, channel. Do you think there's room in the electronic media for increased channel capacity given over to something other than uh, entertainment? Or can you see it developing? Well, uh, or, of, I, I, right, of course. Know. Well, you know, I mean, I think part of the problem is that you need to do things in manageable yeah. uh, uh, bites, mm -hmm. uh, not a nine-second soundbite, right. but not a 24-hour broadcast of the mm -hmm. General Assembly mm -hmm. either. And uh, we're about to publish this fall a book on the conglomerates and the media. Oh, really? Uh, okay. Which discusses very specifically what happened in the various media. And one of the very important changes in American life has been the fact that as the networks became increasingly conglomeratized, as yeah. the Disneys and the Westinghouses and the Tishas bought the networks, yeah. they began to say that the news divisions had to be profit centers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And thus came tabloid TV. Yeah. But uh, at the same time, you had a decision to cut, shut down the foreign bureaus mm -hmm. because those cost a lot of money. Right. So I don't know if you notice increasingly, if you watch news broadcasts and there's somebody coming in from Albania or Afghanistan or mm -hmm. whatever, mm -hmm. he has an English accent. Yeah. Now, mm -hmm. why is that? It's mm -hmm. because we're living off the British yeah. uh, state in that respect and buying a feed from the BBC or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so that our own ability to have people there uh, has been seriously impaired by the profit pressures. Mm -hmm. So there's a very clear case where the news coverage, which doesn't have to be the full coverage of the UN Assembly or whatever, yeah. but certainly what's happening at, at these key points yeah. is endangered by the profit decisions that were taken some years ago yeah. in which just as Pantheon had been within Random House, the place where you had all these books on current affairs and so on and so right. forth, yeah. so n the news divisions had been the crown jewels in that right. respect, and right. you said, all right, we may not make money having a bureau in, in Beijing yes, or right. in Tehran or mm -hmm. whatever, mm -hmm. uh, but we need to do that in order to cover the world. Yeah. So uh, these decisions are not necessarily decisions of let's keep the people in ignorance, let's become a more isolationist country, let's stop talking about ideas elsewhere and so on. Mm -hmm. Of course, those aren't the decisions that are taken. The decisions that are taken saying, News division made 11.2 percent instead of 14.3 percent, mm -hmm. and therefore we're going to cut down those foreign bureaus and make up that difference. Boy, there's challenges, aren't there? There's some incredible mm -hmm. challenges to try and keep uh, alive and open the avenues to good ideas that can be transformed of liberating the human condition. And I just can only say that your efforts over the years, congratulate you on those uh, at Pantheon and also now with the New Press. I want to congratulate you very much on the five years and uh, on your good work as you can begin to continue. Uh, ahead into the information environment that you're having a hand in helping to steer into the right direction. And I uh, thank you very much. And Andre um, uh, Schifrin at the New Press, it's been your pleasure to have his perception. Sorry, we run right out of time. Uh, we'll be coming back again next week uh, at the same time. That's it for now, Andre Schifrin, New Press here in New York City. Uh, please tune in. We'll look forward to seeing you again next week. Until next time. Oh, good. Okay. I thought time. we'd started a little later than 10 too, but I well, guess no, that was fine. Just, no, that's just about go. coming yeah. in, right? And we're still open. We should. Oh, uh, right. We shouldn't. Uh, this is right. this is really this is really good. What you're doing, you know, can do, and um, uh, it's a challenge to put it mildly. You know, <laughs> the things that are going on. I'm trying to do things in cable television and that. Right. Trying to see a link between those kind of things. You know, Danny. Uh, what's his name? Schachter. Schachter.